This is all about Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things questions and markets related Bitcoin, little B for the currency and Bitcoin, big B for the network. A collective journey to understand, apply and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Let's take a look at some of our top stories. Almost a third of Salvadorans are actively using the state issued Chivo Bitcoin wallet. President Naib Bukele tweeting some stats you can see here, almost uh, two and a quarter million active users, as well as new active users per day, declining to about 150,000 uh, down there from about 250,000 the previous week and 199 active ATMs, we can see. If the figures are accurate, more people are using cryptocurrency than any particular bank in El Salvador less than a month after BTC became legal tender there. But not everyone using the Chiva wallet is having a rosy experience. Bitcoin Magazine journalist Aaron Van Verdam tweeting, Chivo ATM ate my Bitcoin today. No cash in return, no receipt, no response from customer service. I'll get by without the $40, but it's probably safe to assume that this also happens to Salvadorans who aren't on Twitter. Not good at all. Meanwhile, China's crackdown on crypto continues. Authorities in China's Inner Mongolia province seizing 10,100 crypto mining rigs from a government-operated tech park, according to local media there. This comes days after top government officials renewed a ban on crypto trading and mining. Separately, Huobi Global announcing Sunday it would stop serving existing users in China by the end of the year. This morning on Coindesk TV's first mover, Bobby Lee, co-founder of the first Bitcoin exchange in China, BTCC, saying following China's shutdown of crypto exchanges, over-the-counter trading desks are likely to follow suit. Have a listen. So I think OTC platforms that are operated from the big exchanges, the Huobi and so on, and Binance, they will, they will close down, they will stop offering their services to the Chinese uh, mainline users. So I think the last few days, I think there's still uh, OTC users, you know, making transactions. I think that will just taper off. I think... Uh, I think what, what's happening is with capital controls and the strong sort of regulatory pressure on Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin and crypto assets is, are going to become what we consider what we call foreign assets. Think of, think of mainland Chinese uh, citizens who may own real estate property in another country, in Australia, in Canada, in the United States. So Bitcoin becomes that kind of foreign asset where you can't sell that foreign property from within mainland China, but if one day you were to travel to that country uh, for on vacation or for whatever work reason, then when you're abroad, you can then take care of buying and selling these foreign assets. All right, let's have a live look at Bitcoin. The coin is Bitcoin price. XBX index currently under $43,000, trading at 42978 Bitcoin slightly down about six-tenths of a percent over the past 24 hours. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. Crypto funds are drawing the most new money in three weeks, even amid China's crackdown. Investors pumping $95 million into digital asset products last week, more than double the prior week's pace, according to a CoinShares weekly report. With the headwinds that digital assets have faced recently, such as China's ban, the inflows suggest that price declines may have been seen as a buying opportunity. Bitcoin saw the largest inflows of any crypto investment product with a total of $50 million. Also, the most in three weeks. Although Bitcoin has experienced the brunt of negative investor sentiment over the last two quarters, the report said. Funds focus on the largest cryptocurrency by market value have suffered outflows in all but four of the past 17 weeks. Joining us now to discuss is Adam Bloomberg, co-founder of financial advisory firm Interaxis. Welcome, Adam. So as you see, there are a lot of headwinds for Bitcoin, such as China's crypto crackdown, as well as global regulatory uncertainty, yet Bitcoin is doing fairly well, all things considered. Why is that? Well, all things considered. Uh, thanks, Christine. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's doing fairly well, you know, partially because it's Bitcoin, right? And, and it still has been around the longest. It still has the most institutional adoption, regardless of the fact that, you know, your chart shows that that overall in the last several weeks, the last few dozen weeks, right? In uh, Institutional adoption has been down a bit, but 
it still has the most institutional adoption. It still has the most, um, the, the most, uh, you know, education around it. It has the most infrastructure around it. So, and so many people have been holding Bitcoin for so long that their their reasoning for buying it originally hasn't really changed. We've seen the price go way up and way down just in this year, but their reasoning, their investment thesis hasn't changed. And of course, it's not changing uh, when when we still see inflation. We still see the the value of the dollar going down a bit overall. We still see money getting printed and and i can go to coffee shops i can go to restaurants i can go anywhere else here in town where i am and i'm starting to see the effects of inflation so if that's the main investment thesis that we need a store of value and in inflation hedge then that that's why the price hasn't been horribly affected by news that we saw come out of china right let's talk about institutional adoption for a second so we had uh anthony scaramucci uh, founder of Skybridge Capital. He talks a lot of hedge funds, especially on Wall Street, telling Bloomberg earlier that institutional interest in Bitcoin is actually not that strong. They are still very hesitant to get in. And so I'm wondering what your experience is. He's saying that of the 10% of the hedge funds out there or the institutional investors out there, uh, they're making a a lot of uh, promotion and encouragement to enter the Bitcoin space, but that can be a little disorienting in terms of how many institutional investors are actually invested in the space. Right. And this is one of the things we teach, Christine. We, we talk to financial advisors and we say you really have to watch out who you listen to and, and who you're reading about on Twitter and who you're reading from anywhere else. To, that is telling you the institutions are coming. I've talked to, you know, you'll see people on Twitter say, I've talked to institutions. They are ready to invest in Bitcoin. You have no idea how much money is, is coming in. Um, we just don't know till they actually put their dollars in, till they actually go and buy the Bitcoin. We don't know what's really happening. Of course, uh, Anthony uh, Scaramucci is going to have a little bit more insight into that if he's actually talking to them. But then you got to wonder how many other hedge fund managers, how many other institutions are honestly telling him what they're going to do with their money. What I will say is knowing what what I know of institutions, which is not to say I'm I'm you know any genius or, or you know have great experience with them, but they didn't get to be where they are. They didn't get to be multi billion dollar institutions by making quick investment decisions, by be deciding based on a price movement early one year that they were going to get into something. So mm -hmm. if they were deciding whether or not they're going to get in Bitcoin, say late last year, and they saw the price run up and they thought maybe we're too late and they saw it go down and maybe they thought, wow, now we're a little bit worried. This volatility you know, has us a little un unhinged a little bit. Maybe they're just waiting around to see what's going to happen, see what the market's going to do. Of course, they want to wait and see what regulators are going to do. They see you know, the, the news from China. So maybe it's people that do have this extremely long time horizon, this inflation hedge thesis and mentality saying, we're going to see what this crazy year does, the, you know, the reopening after COVID, maybe the shutting down because of COVID again. We don't know what's going to happen. There are plenty of other investments that institutions can get into, not to say Bitcoin's a bad one, but they have a multitude of other options to, with their money. And maybe they're just taking a wait and see approach with Bitcoin. Maybe they've all done their homework. Maybe all got, they all have their would, wallets or, or their Would you agree with the opinion out there that institutional adoption is just not there yet? Um, I would agree with the opinion that for the most part, institutional adoption is just not there. I don't think most institutions are ready for Bitcoin. I don't think they're ready for what comes with the volatility and the cu the custody. And I don't think they're ready to deal with the regulators. I, I think they're okay investing in things where they understand the regulatory framework and they understand what the regulators are going to do. And th there are plenty of other options for them. So I don't think the adoption is there yet. Mm -hmm. Speaking of regulation, we spoke about China earlier. They are cracking down on Bitcoin, particularly trading. And so this could be a potential headwind for Bitcoin. And I, I wonder what you believe the impact of having China out of the crypto market will be. Uh, of course, it, it, on the surface, it looks like it's a negative impact. With those of us that, like you, Christine, that are in Bitcoin and in crypto every day, I, we feel like we've heard this from China at least a few times this year, much less in the last few years. So we'll see what actually happens. But anytime you, you have an asset like Bitcoin that has a limited supply and you tear down quite a bit of the potential demand for it, you would think that the price would follow down. 
right? When you lower the demand for an asset like that, you would think the price would go down. On top of the fact that, that China has been so far ahead in terms of developments for Bitcoin. Of course, all the miners are, are made in Bitcoin. They're manufactured in, in, in China. So um, it probably would have somewhat of a negative effect, at least in the short term on the market. But we'll see what China really has planned for Bitcoin. Um, of course, you know, I'm in Texas, so I'm happy to see all those miners come here to Texas. We got plenty of natural gas and, and plenty of energy for them here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that eventually China will completely, uh, ha much like the Internet is an intranet there, it, there will be no, only a centralized cryptocurrency, their digital yuan there, and they'll try to eradicate all other cryptocurrencies? Again, I'm, not, I'm no expert on foreign policy or anything, but uh, you have to imagine looking at what China has done in the past that having this currency out there that millions and millions, probably billions of their people are trying to use, that the Chinese government has no con has very little control over. Right. Um, they don't really get to, you know, kind of watch and, and well, spy. Adam, and, and what do you think what the U.S. will do compared to China? Because the U.S. is also looking into regulating the crypto space. So how do you think that will impact the, the industry? The, the impact on the industry, again, most of the industry here in the U.S., I feel like is taking somewhat of a wait and see approach, especially institutional adoption. We're going to wait and see what regulators are going to do. It seems like there's going to be more regulation coming down in terms of some of the tokens that are being released, in terms of some of the decentralized exchanges, uh, seeing which of these tokens, which of these protocols can be deemed securities. Uh, it seems like there is going to be more regulation in, in that realm under the uh, assumption that the SEC, for example, is charged with investor protection. We want to make sure that investors are not getting scammed, they're not losing their money. And so they're going to take a look at some of these assets or some of these tokens and decide, were these securities to begin with? That's where some of the regulation is going to come down. Right. Um, you know, a bit of a silver lining in, in the Bitcoin community is El Salvador, an emerging market, of course, that has adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. Now, there are some rating agencies who are not a fan, the downgrading their credit rating because of this. But I wonder uh, what your thoughts on this adoption might take. I mean, there, there are a couple of glitches. We, we showed a tweet from a reporter down there who is having trouble accessing Bitcoin uh, through the Bitcoin ATMs there. Uh, but they are having growing usership, a third of the country. So if this is successful or you see it moving along, do you see other countries potentially adopting Bitcoin? I think we'll see more and more countries that are going to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. They're going to give their their, their shopkeepers are going to give their retailers and their people the ability to use Bitcoin because as El Salvador, the position they were in was they were tied to what the U.S. did anyway. And I think they were tired of having to wait and see and, and be kind of at the mercy of the Fed here. So I think you'll see more and more countries do it. And look, we applaud El Salvador. This is what Satoshi wanted it to begin with, right? This is what the idea of Bitcoin was, was this currency that could be freely exchanged without the need for, really the need for a government or a bank or anything to intercede. So the people of El Salvador are really taking them up on it and, you know, and obviously utilizing it, getting their wallets, getting their Bitcoin, exchanging it freely. Uh, so I think it's great. I think it's great for Bitcoin. I think it's great for cryptocurrency, decentralized finance overall. And of course, there are going to be more countries that uh, are going to enable Bitcoin and are, and are going to enable crypto as legal tender because it's, it just makes more sense for them to do so. Okay, and that's pr pretty bullish for Bitcoin. So what are you advising your clients in terms of allocation is now good and is now a good time to buy Bitcoin? Uh, what we advise and what we tell the other advisors that we educate to advise is it, obviously it's going to base, be based completely on the risk profile. We, we don't tell overall, we don't give uh, investment advice unless it's to one of our clients who we know quite a bit about. So it's based on their risk profile, their their overall investment allocation, what they need. And we're probably still saying not more than 5% of their total assets uh, if, they, uh, if they can handle being moderate to pretty aggressive with their risk profile, then we're telling them, look, 
it's not a matter of timing. We're not trying to time the market. If you're into Bitcoin, you're into crypto, you're more than likely doing it for something like a long-term inflation hedge, a long-term store of value. So you need to have a very long time horizon. Remember, Bitcoin has an infinite time horizon. Most of the hedge funds we talk to, most of the hedge funds that you, you probably will reference, have an extremely long time horizon, whereas most people do not. Therefore, we need to take into account when are you going to need this money? What, what can you handle? What can you stomach in terms of volatility? And what is the rest of your portfolio like? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some of the younger people that, that have plenty of, of money that they want to put a little bit into Bitcoin, it, it's not a matter of timing, quite honestly, Christine. It, it's just looking and saying, look, the, does the investment thesis of an inflation hedge or store value make sense in your portfolio? And if so, then talk to your advisor about it and see if it makes sense. Okay. Well, last question. I, we like to hear a uh, price prediction. So what, what's your outlook on Bitcoin for the end of the year versus next year? Uh, is this a price prediction I'm going to be held to? I, I think we, we definitely hit those all-time highs again, uh, at least uh, up in the 60s probably. I, I would say we probably get up above 70 to 75 or so by the end of, before the end of this year. Um, I think fall is going to be really good. I think there's going to be some adoption. Of course, that's you know, assuming, look, if we've taken this hit from China and China has said we're going to outlaw all cryptocurrency and Bitcoin has not dropped below where it is right now, that I think it's a pretty bullish sign. So right. I'm going to say probably under six figures still, but but getting up in the 70s. Excellent. We'll leave it there. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Christine. Happy to be here. All right. That was Adam Lemberg of InterAxis. Adam is speaking next week at a special Coindesk event, Bitcoin for Advisors. Join us on October 6th for this virtual experience, a chance to connect with over 300 investment advisors who are leading the way toward the future of investing. Financial advisors can register for free on our website at coindesk.com slash events. That's it for All About Bitcoin. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in New York for First Mover, your first look at the day's global crypto news headlines. You're watching Coindesk TV.